What an awesome privilege it is to be with you again tonight. I pray that God has been revealing himself to us. I pray that you have been rejoicing in the word of God. I'm excited to be with you tonight. We have a lot to cover tonight and by the power of the Holy Spirit. Oh, may we get right into the word. I invite you to bow your heads with me as we acknowledge the awesome presence of our God and Savior Jesus Christ. Father, we just want to thank you for salvation full and free. We thank you for redemption through the blood of Jesus Christ. Open before us the beauty of your word. Open before us the treasures of your kingdom. And may we see Jesus high and lifted. This is our desire, Lord. In Jesus' wonderful name, amen and amen. My desire for us is that we come to know Jesus in a better way. We come into a closer encounter with Jesus. We come into a closer walk with Jesus. Tonight, we want to take another look into the sanctuary. As the psalmist says, God's way has been revealed to us in the sanctuary. May God continue to reveal his awesome goodness to us. As we continue with the theme, the path of the just, preparing a generation to walk by faith. May we truly learn to walk by faith as we walk with the Spirit of God. As we walk with the Spirit of God and get into a closer walk with Jesus. Tonight, let's look at our key text one more time. Proverbs chapter 4 verse 18, the wise man says that the path of the just is as a shining light that gets brighter and brighter onto the perfect day. We look forward to that day when we shall see Jesus face to face. That's the ultimate perfect day. When we shall see God as he is, for we shall be like him. Praise God. I, love, I look forward to that day. What about you? Our key passage, let's go through our key passage one more time. It comes from the book Evangelism, section 8. The chapter entitled, The Sanctuary Truth. Five important points there. Point number one, the correct understanding of the ministration of Jesus in the heavenly sanctuary is the foundation of our faith. It continues, it says, this subject of the sanctuary should be clearly understood by all of God's people. Number three, without this understanding of the sanctuary of who Jesus truly is, it would not be possible for us to exercise faith in the last days and hold on to Jesus when things get difficult. Number four, the sanctuary in heaven is the very center of Christ's work. And number five, we should be earnest students of prophecy and we should not rest until we become intelligent. In the subject of salvation, intelligent in the subject of the sanctuary, intelligent in the subject of redemption. May the Holy Spirit open before us the treasures of God's word. Tonight, we want to look at the topic, God's timepiece. As we delve into the sanctuary one more time, remember at the very first presentation, we discovered that the structure and the ceremonies of the sanctuary reveal to us the sequence and the process of salvation. Let me say that again. The structure of the sanctuary and the ceremonies associated with or in the sanctuary reveal to us the sequence and the process of salvation. Tonight, we want to take a look at the ceremonies, the annual ceremonies within the sanctuary and see how they reveal the magnitude of the love of God, the wisdom of the love of God, and the salvation that we receive through our Savior Jesus Christ. Well, let's begin as we lay the foundation tonight. Matthew chapter 5, verse 17, a very popular verse. We know that verse. The Bible says, do not think, and this is Jesus speaking. Jesus speaking, he says, do not think that I have come into the world to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, the law or the prophets, but to fulfill them. Then Jesus says, I tell you the truth, until heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, nor the least stroke of a pen. We know this verse very carefully, very beautifully in the King James Version. 
But Jesus is saying, I did not come to destroy the law or the prophets. Now, many times when we discuss this text, we use it to prove that the Ten Commandments are still binding and in particular, the Sabbath. But the truth is, this text is not really talking about the Ten Commandments or the Sabbath. The phrase, the law and the prophets, in verse 17, is a very popular phrase. Was a very popular phrase among the Jewish people. And throughout the New Testament, we see this phrase, the law and the prophets. The law refers to the five books of Moses, the Torah. And the prophets refer to the, to the major and minor prophets and all the other books, including the writings. So Jesus was talking about the Old Testament in its, in its entirety. Jesus says, I did not come to destroy the law of the prophets. I came to fulfill them. Our task tonight is to enter into the sanctuary and its ceremonies to see how Jesus fulfilled those things that were spoken of or written of him. As we begin tonight, as we begin tonight, there were seven ceremonial feasts in the, New, in the Old Testament. Seven ceremonial feasts. We find this in Leviticus 23 and Deuteronomy 16. Leviticus 23, Deuteronomy 16. Write down those references. Those seven ceremonial feasts are in there. The Jewish calendar, take note of this, take note of this, write this down. The Jewish calendar was divided into a religious calendar and a civil calendar. As we proceed, it's going to make a lot more sense to us. But the Jews had two separate calendars. They had a religious calendar and they had a civil or regular calendar. Pretty much that, that's what happens in our day. We have the regular calendar, which begins January 1, but every student knows that the school year begins September, September 10th, thereabout. So there is a school calendar, and then there is the regular calendar. The Jews had a ceremonial calendar, and they had the regular civil calendar. Now take note of this. The Jewish religious year, write this down. The Jewish religious year, began on the first day of the month of Abib. In some scholarly work, you will find it, they say the month of Nisan. Some say the month, of, the month of Abib. It doesn't make a difference. The first or the Jewish religious year. I want to take my time. We have a lot to cover, but I want to take my time. This is, this is, this is significant. This is important. The Jewish religious year began on the first day of the month of Abib. We find this in Exodus chapter 12, verse 2, when the children of Israel are getting ready to leave, to leave Egypt. God says to Moses, the Lord said to Moses and to Aaron in Egypt, this month that you're about to leave Egypt is going to be to you the first month of the year. And the context here is in reference to the ceremonial year. And we're going to see this as we proceed. So take note of this. Each month, each month or every month in the Jewish religious year. Look at this. Every month in the Jewish religious year or ceremonial year began with a new moon. And we find this in Numbers chapter 10, verse 10. Also at your times of rejoicing, your appointed feast and your new moon festivals. You have to sound the trumpet in celebration of those ceremonial months. So it was the responsibility of the priest to sound a trumpet to indicate to the nation of Israel that the ceremonial month had begun. Because the priest had the authority if the harvest was not ready. You see, the ceremonial feast were designed around the harvest. If the harvest was not ready, then the priest had the authority from God to postpone. And so when the harvest was ready and the feast 
could have been executed, the priest would sound that trumpet to let them know, hey, this is the first of the month. And it began at new moon. And the celebration would proceed. So take note of this. The ceremonial month is the first month of Abib in the Jewish religious year. Note of this. The civil year. There was a religious year and then there was a civil year. The civil year began on the first of Tishri. The civil year began on the first of Tishri, the month of Tishri. Now, in addition to the observance of new moons, which began or started every religious month, the Jews also had a number of feast days, festivals, and Sabbaths. Some of these festivals are called Sabbaths. In the Old Testament, they are recorded as a Sabbath. There were a number out of the seven annual feasts that the Jews celebrated. Some of those feasts, and we're going to get into them tonight, some of those feasts were treated as Sabbaths. So the Jews would cease from doing all their regular work just as they would on the Sabbath. The Sabbath is the seventh day of the week. But the ceremonial Sabbaths, which fell on a particular date, that date could fall on any day of the week. When that date falls on that particular day of the week, you treat that day as a holy day, just the same way as you would treat the weekly Sabbath. We're going to get into this. So these are the seven feasts that are associated with the sanctuary. These are the seven feasts that the Jews celebrated. All the men were to gather at Jerusalem for Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Let's look at the seven feasts together. The first feast is Passover. Passover took place on the 14th of Abib or the 14th of the first month of the year, of the ceremonial year. Get this, everybody. The first month of the Jewish ceremonial year began with the first feast of Passover. We're going to get into each of these with, in detail. The second feast was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Feast of Unleavened Bread ran from the 15th to the 21st. It was seven days long. The first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the 15th, was a Sabbath, a ceremonial Sabbath. And the 21st, the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, was also a Sabbath. The third feast was Wave Sheaf. Wave Sheaf was the 16th of Abib. The fourth feast was Pentecost. Pentecost came 50 days after Wave Sheaf. So the Jews were to count seven weeks, that's 49 plus one, 50. In fact, the word penta means 50. Then we have the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets came at the beginning of the civil year. Now take note of this, take note of this. The first feast, Passover, came at the beginning of the ceremonial year. The Feast of Trumpets was the beginning of the civil year. It's almost as though God is transitioning into something else. Then the sixth feast, Atonement, the 10th day of Tishri. And the final feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, from the 15th to the 22nd. The Feast of Tabernacles was the final feast, but it was also the longest feast. Let's get into some details tonight. Let's get into some details tonight. These are the first three feasts. The first feast is the feast of Passover. Passover was the beginning of the religious year. We have a lot to cover tonight. Let's go, let's go, let's go. Passover was the beginning of the religious year. 
Passover took place on the 14th of Abib. You find this in Leviticus chapter 23. We are going to spend some time in Leviticus 23. So write this down, write down the reference. Leviticus chapter 23. The 14th day of the first month of the religious year, the 14th of Abib. What happened on that day? Please take note that the 14th of Abib Passover was not a Sabbath. It was not a holy day. There was no requirement to cease from work. There was no national gathering. Passover took place at home. The celebration of Passover took place at home. And Jesus says, if your family is too small for the lamb, call your neighbor and let's have that, that feast together. Passover began, the very first Passover began in Egypt. The night before the children of Israel left Egyptian bondage, they were to kill that lamb and spare the blood, sprinkle the blood on the doorposts. So when the passing angel, the destroying angel passed over, he would see the blood and know that those who are in that house are underneath the blood. Hallelujah. And no destruction would come upon them. Listen to this. For the preparation of Passover, the lamb that was going to be slain for the celebration of the Passover meal had to be taken from the flock from the 10th. Remember, Passover is a celebration on the 14th of Abib. But the lamb had to be separated from the 10th and set aside. The Passover meal of unleavened bread was eaten in the early hours of the 14th, in the evening of the 14th. Now look at this. Please put on your Jewish thinking caps. The evening of the 14th, if Passover is the 14th, the evening of the 14th is not the evening that comes after, it is the evening that comes before. That's why the evening of Sabbath is the evening that comes before the Sabbath day. So if today, if today was the 14th, or let me put it this way, this is the evening time. If tomorrow is the 14th, if tomorrow is the 14th, the, the 14th of Abib, which is Passover day, then the Passover meal would have been eaten tonight. We are not operating under the Roman way of calculating time. We are operating under the Jewish calculation of time. And so if tomorrow the 14th of Abib is Passover day, the Passover meal would be eaten tonight. And according to the Roman way of reckoning time, it would be eaten the evening of the 13th, the evening before the 14th. I hope, it, I hope you're understanding this. And so this was the first feast in the annual feast we are talking about the annual feast they happened once a year on the 14th of abib that passover lamb was set aside from the 10th the meal was prepared before the evening of the 14th and it was eaten on the evening of the 14th which is the evening that comes the night time that comes before the day of the 14th that's the Passover meal there. The second feast, the second feast is the feast of unleavened bread. All the leaven had to be taken out of the house even before Passover began. So by the time the children of Israel are celebrating Passover, all the leaven has been removed from the house. So by the time the 15th comes, the house is already clean. From all the leaven. Leaven is a symbol of sin. So the children of Israel had to take the leaven out of the house. Now the second feast, which is the feast of unleavened bread, is celebrated from the 15th of Abib to the 21st of Abib. That is seven days. Look at this. The first day of the feast of unleavened bread, which is the 15th of Abib, is a Sabbath. It is not the weekly Sabbath, which is Saturday. It is a Sabbath. A Sabbath that can fall on any day of the week. 
By the way, historically speaking, the Jews only celebrated Passover on Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays. The Jews, this is historically documented. The Jews only celebrated Passover on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. We're going to get into that tonight. This is a beautiful study tonight. So the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the 15th, and the last day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is the 21st, are both ceremonial Sabbaths. No regular work is to be done on that day. The children of Israel have to treat that day as though it is one of the weekly Sabbath. It is just week, the weekly Sabbath. Treat it as a holy day. All the men in Jerusalem, all the men in the Jewish nation have to gather at Jerusalem for the celebration of unleavened bread. That's the second feast. The third feast, look at this everybody, the third feast falls on the 16th of Abib. The first feast was on the 14th of Abib, that's Passover. The second feast is the Feast of Unleavened Bread for seven days from the 15th to the 21st. But the third feast is Wave Shif. So we have the 14th, 15th, 16th. Wave Shif is on the 16th of Abib. And it is not a Sabbath. It is not a ceremonial Sabbath. It is not a convocation. No restriction on work is given for that day. Note this, note this, note this. The first fruit of the body harvest is presented before the Lord. The children of Israel would have harvested the barley from their fields. And on the 16th of Abib, they are waving that barley, the barley branches. They are waving the barley branches before the Lord as an act of worship. And they are saying to the Lord, thank you for a bountiful harvest of barley. And they are celebrating the barley harvest. So these are the first three feasts. The first, the 14th is Passover. The 15th to the 21st is Feast of Unleavened Bread, and the 16th is the first fruit of the barley harvest. The fourth feast is Pentecost. Pentecost comes 50 days after wave shift. You find all of this in Leviticus 23. All of this is found in Leviticus, in Leviticus 23. All the men were to gather in Jerusalem for Pentecost. That's why on the day of Pentecost so many people were there because all the men are required to gather at Jerusalem. This was on the 5th of Zin. V in Hebrew is pronounced as an N. So this Pentecost was on the 5th of Zin. 50 days, not this. This is 50 days after wave shift. Wave shift was the first fruit, a celebration. We're going back to wave shift. Wave shift was the first fruit, the celebration of the barley harvest. 50 days later is Pentecost. Pentecost is a celebration of another first fruit. This time is the first fruit of the wheat harvest. So at wave shift, the children of Israel waved before the Lord the barley branches and said, thank you, Lord, for a bountiful harvest of barley. Fifty days later, they are also celebrating another first fruit. But this time it's the first fruit of the wheat. They bake two wheat bread. And they present that bread before the Lord. And they are saying to the Lord, thank you for a bountiful harvest of wheat. Please note this. This is important. At wave shift, the children of Israel celebrated a bountiful harvest of barley. Fifty days later at Pentecost, they are celebrating a bountiful harvest of wheat. So both wave shift and Pentecost are two celebrations of first fruit. Wave shift is the first fruit of the barley harvest, and Pentecost is the first fruit of the wheat harvest. 
Pentecost was a holy day. Pentecost was a Sabbath. No regular work was to be done on that day. Amen. Let's move on to the fifth feast. The fifth feast is the Feast of Trumpets. The fifth feast is the Feast of Trumpets. The Feast of Trumpets marks the beginning of the civil calendar. There has been a transition. The children of Israel have transitioned from almost from the ceremonial calendar into the civil calendar. So the Feast of Trumpets is on the first of Tishri and the first of Tishri is the beginning of the civil year. The priest blew a trumpet throughout the nation of Israel and that trumpet, that blowing of the trumpet, which is called the Feast of the Trumpet, was to warn the children of Israel that in another 10 days, judgment was coming. What's that judgment? The Day of Atonement. So the Feast of Trumpets is on the first of Tishri when the priest blew the trumpet throughout the nation to warn them, put your house in order, get things right, take your offerings to the sanctuary, confess your sins, fast and pray and seek God, interceding for each other and get an encounter, closer walk with God because the day of judgment is coming and if you are not ready, you will be cut off. Remember, God does not send judgment until he sends a warning. So the Feast of Trumpets was a warning to the children of Israel that judgment was coming in the next 10 days. And then in 10 days, the Day of Atonement came, which is the holiest day of the year. On that day, the high priest officiated there. We looked at this before. The high priest officiated on the Day of Atonement, conducted three specific things. He brought in the incense into the most holy place, covered the Shekinah glory. He brought in the blood of the, of, of the bullock, made an atonement for himself and his family, then brought in the blood of the Lord's goat, made an atonement for the people. God accepted that atonement and the nation of Israel, the sanctuary and all the instruments in there were clean and cleansed from all the sins of the people. And then the final feast, Feast of Tabernacles. Feast of Tabernacles is the final feast in the ceremonial system. This was the last of the feast, but it was also the longest of the feast. You find all of this in Leviticus 23. Get this, I want you to get some important points concerning the Feast of Tabernacles. This is beautiful. The Feast of Tabernacles was the longest feast, eight days long, from the 15th to the 22nd. It was also the last, the last feast was the longest of all the feasts. Note this, the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the 15th, was a Sabbath. It was a holy day. The last day of the Feast of Tabernacles, the 22nd, was also a Sabbath, a holy day. All the children, all the men, everybody had to gather and celebrate that feast. For seven days, listen to this. For seven days, the children of Israel moved out of their permanent homes and dwelt in a temporary tent. They waved branches of palms and willows and everything that they, have, they had harvested over the year. They waved branches before the Lord and they are celebrating a bountiful harvest over the entire year. Remember, at Wave Sheaf, they have celebrated the barley harvest. At Pentecost, they have celebrated the wheat harvest. And throughout the year, God had given them bountiful harvest. On that final feast, the Feast of Tabernacles, which is the last feast and the longest feast, the children of Israel are celebrating all the harvest that God had given them over the year. They have left their permanent homes, gathered in a temporary shelter for eight days, and they are saying to God, thank you for a bountiful harvest. You also find this in Exodus 23. 
the children of Israel, as they gather in the Feast of Tabernacles, are rejoicing over two specific things. One, they are rejoicing that God sent the rain upon the, their crops to give them a bountiful harvest. Were it not for God who had sent the rain, they would not have been able to get a bountiful harvest. So they are thanking God for a bountiful harvest by giving everything back to God. And number two, the children of Israel are rejoicing that the day of atonement came and passed and they are still alive. The holiest day of the year, the year of judgment just passed. The day of judgment just passed and they are still alive. And they give the credit to the high priest who performed his job and interceded on their behalf and they are alive today and they are celebrating the Feast of Tabernacles because they are rejoicing that judgment passed and they were covered by the blood of the Lord's goat that was offered for them. And these are the seven feasts that God has set before us. The first set of feasts, Passover, 14th of Abib. The second feast, the 15th to the 21st of Abib, That's unleavened bread. The third feast, wave sheaf, 16th of Abib. The fourth feast, Pentecost, 50 days after wave sheaf. The sixth, the fifth feast, feast of trumpets, first of Tishri, beginning of the civil year. Atonement, the 10th, and feast of tabernacles, the 15th to the 22nd. Remember, 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 Jesus says to us, you now these are the feasts that pointed to the ministry of Jesus. These are the feasts that pointed to what God was going to send Jesus to do. Listen to what Jesus said. Remember what Jesus said to us. In Matthew chapter 5 verse 17, Jesus says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law and the prophets, the Old Testament, which testify of me. I did not come to destroy. Jesus says, I, come, I came to fulfill them. Let's see how Jesus fulfills those feasts and how they relate to our salvation get this everybody look at this write this down write this down write this down i'm excited the first four feasts what are the first four feasts we are talking about the fulfillment of those feasts the first four feasts passover the 14th of abib unleavened bread the 15th to the 21st wave shift the 16th and Pentecost, the fifth of sin. The first four feasts were fulfilled by Jesus and the early church. The last three feasts relate to the last days of earth's history. Get this. The first four feasts, Passover, unleavened bread, wave shift, and Pentecost, the first four feasts, relate to the first advent of Jesus. The last three feasts relate to the second advent of Jesus. So the first four were fulfilled by Jesus and the early church because they relate to the first advent, while the last three, Feast of Trumpets, Atonement, and Feast of Tabernacles, the last three relate to the second advent and the last day. Listen to this. This is exciting. This is exciting. I'm excited. Read this from the book Great Controversies, chapter 22. Those who mess this up are the people who have put Sister White aside. I just, I just thought I needed to say that to us. I've listened to many preachers make a mess out of this. Because they are not paying attention to the instructions given to the church. Listen to what is written there in the Great Controversy, chapter 22. These types, which are the feasts, these feasts, that's the first four feasts, were fulfilled not only as to the event, but as to the time. Read that again. 
These types, which are the feast, the first four, Passover, unleavened bread, feast of wave shift, and Pentecost, were fulfilled not only to the event, but as to the time. Because Jesus says, I am come to fulfill that which was written, that which was spoken of of me. Let's see Jesus as he fulfilled. The Bible, Paul has a beautiful text there that I want us to read. It says in Galatians chapter 4, 4 and 5. Listen to this, listen to this. Galatians chapter 4, 4 and 5. Paul writes, but when the time had fully come, God sent his son born of a woman, born under the law. I like the way the King James Version has this. But when the fullness of time had come, you know what the fullness of time means? It means when the right time was right. It means when the right time could not have been any more right. Am I making sense? God's timepiece, God's timetable, God's way of working out our salvation was planned from the foundation of the world. God in his wisdom and his, in his might and his omnipotence and his omniscience planned and calculated everything concerning Jesus to the iota, to the finest detail. Everything concerning Jesus was already planned before he came. And Paul says, when the fullness of time was come, when Jesus, when it was the right time for Jesus to come, he came into this world and everything concerning Jesus is about to be fulfilled exactly as God said it would and exactly when God said it would. He came that he might redeem us who were under the law. And so look at this sense, Jesus, Jesus, when he came into this world, he died exactly on the Passover day. The ministry of Jesus, the, his birth and his life led him to that day. Jesus died on the Passover day. That's why Paul calls him our Passover lamb that was offered for us. Listen to what John tells us concerning the, 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 the last supper that Jesus had with his disciples. Listen to this. John says to us, in John chapter 13, verse 1, it was just before the Passover feast, Jesus knew that his time had come for him to leave the world, to go to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he should now show, he had showed them the full extent of his love. So in John 13, this is the record of the Last Supper that Jesus is having with his disciples there where he washed their feet. And John is saying to us that Jesus held the Last Supper before the Passover feast. Are we understanding this? Jesus knew that his time had come and on the Passover day, he would be hanging on a cross and the evening before the Passover, he would be dragged over all the world between Pilate and Herod and between the religious rulers. He knew that the evening of the Passover, he would be under arrest. And so he has the Passover meal before the appointed time of the Passover. And by the time Passover comes, the day of the Passover, Jesus is hanging on the cross as the Passover lamb whose blood must be sprinkled upon us to protect us from the destroying angel, the devil. Jesus died. He died at the appointed time. He was crucified exactly on the right day. The 14th of Abib. The 14th of Abib, that Friday that Jesus was hanging on the cross, was Passover day. The 14th of Abib. 
according to the perfect timetable of God. Look at this. If the Friday is the 14th, look at this, hallelujah. If the Friday that Jesus hangs on the cross is the 14th, which is the Passover day, the following day is the 15th. The 15th is the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Get this. <laughs> Hallelujah. This thing is beautiful. Friday is the 14th, which is Passover day that Jesus died. The following day is the 15th. The 15th is the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which makes it a Sabbath, a ceremonial Sabbath. The first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a Sabbath. But it is not just a Sabbath, it is also the Sabbath. Listen to what uh, Matthew tells us in Matthew chapter 28, verse 1. After the Sabbath, at the dawn of the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. In the Greek Bible, the word Sabbath is in the plural. The word Sabbath is in the plural in the Greek Bible. So it says after the Sabbaths. How do we know that? Because John adds to the account. When he says to us in John 19, 31, the Jews, therefore, when Jesus is hanging on the cross that Friday, the 14th of Abib, the Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not re remain upon the cross on the, on the Sabbath day. For that Sabbath was a high day. What is a high day? We understand from the practice of the Jewish people that a high day is when a ceremonial Sabbath, a ceremonial Sabbath from the sanctuary system falls on the Sabbath day. So the Sabbath day following the crucifixion of Jesus is not just a ceremonial Sabbath, the 15th of Abib, but it is also the Sabbath day, the seventh day of the week. And it is called a high day. Because it is both a ceremonial Sabbath and a weekly Sabbath. Remember, it is recorded in the history of the Jews that the Jews only celebrated Passover either a Monday, a Wednesday, or a Friday. So Jesus fulfills Passover. By dying on the Passover day, he was crucified on the Passover day, the 14th of Abib, that Friday. He fulfills the 15th, the, 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 the unleavened bread, the feast of unleavened bread, by resting on the Sabbath. Three days, the Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says, look at this. Wave shift. Wave shift is the 16th of Abib. Remember, wave shift is a first fruit offering of the barley harvest. The 14th, the Passover lamb is eaten, the Passover meal. The 15th is the first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is a Sabbath. And at the crucifixion weekend, it is also the Sabbath. The 16th of Abib is wave shift. During wave shift, the children of Israel waved before God the first fruit of the barley harvest. That's the Sunday the 16th. This is Sunday the 16th. Jesus died on Friday the 14th. Saturday the 15th, he is in the tomb. Sunday the 16th is wave sheaf offering. The children of Israel are supposed to be celebrating the first fruit of the barley harvest. That Sunday when Jesus is resurrected, he goes to heaven. The Bible tells us that he goes to heaven. Why, why did Jesus go to heaven that Sunday morning? Listen to what the Bible says in John 20 verse 17. Everything is recorded there for our learning. 
Jesus waits for Mary at the, at the tomb at, in, in, in the garden. And when Mary saw Jesus, when she saw her Lord, she grabbed onto him. The King James Version says that Jesus said to Mary, don't touch me. But the Greek Bible says, Jesus said, don't hold me back. Hold me back from what? Jesus said, do not hold on to me. Don't hold me back. For I have not yet returned to my father. That very Sunday morning, Jesus has to go to his father. Why is Jesus going to the father on the 16th of Abib? Jesus has to go to present himself as the wave sheaf offering. He presents himself to the father as the first fruit of the resurrection. He presents himself to the father as the first fruit of those who come from the grave. And so Jesus fulfills Passover by dying on the Passover day. Jesus fulfills the 15th by resting on the Sabbath because the 15th is a Sabbath. But that day it was a high day, a double Sabbath in one day. And Jesus also fulfills the 16th by becoming the first fruit of the barley harvest from the grave. And on that Sunday morning, he goes to the Father, presents himself as the first fruit of those who've come from the grave. As the redeemer of the human race, he presents himself to the Father as the resurrection and the life. He presents himself to the Father as the redemption of the human race. The Lamb of God slain from the foundation of the world. That's our Jesus. And Jesus returned to earth that very day. That's when he was walking along on the road to Emmaus. And so Jesus fulfills that. Jesus fulfills the 14th. Look at this. Jesus fulfills the 14th as the Passover lamb. He fulfills the 15th as the Sabbath. Resting. He fulfills the 16th as the first fruit. The wave shift to be waved before the Lord. 15. 50 days after, 50 days after wave shift, look at this everybody, is Pentecost. 50 days after wave shift is Pentecost. Remember, Pentecost is another first fruit. Wave shift was a first fruit of Bali, but Pentecost is a first fruit of the wheat. Remember, after his resurrection, which is wave shift, after his resurrection, which is wave shift, Pentecost comes 50 days after wave shift. So Pentecost is 50 days after the resurrection of Jesus. Jesus get up, got up off the grave on wave shift, 16th of Habib. Now, after his resurrection, look at this praise God, hallelujah, somebody. After his resurrection, Jesus stays with his disciples for 40 days. After his resurrection on wave shift, on the 16th of Abib, Jesus spends 40 days with his disciples. Luke tells us in Acts chapter 1 verse 3, after his suffering, that's after his death, he showed himself to these men, his disciples, giving many convincing proof that he was alive. He appeared to them over a period of 40 days. Jesus stayed with his disciples for 40 days. If Jesus stayed with his disciples for 40 days after his resurrection, it means in the next 10 days is Pentecost because Pentecost is 50 days after the resurrection. And Jesus spends 40 days with his disciples after his resurrection. It means in the next 10 days is Pentecost. Listen to this. Listen to this. When Jesus ascended to heaven after spending 40 days with his disciples after his resurrection, the Bible says he was caught up into the heavens. 
When Jesus ascended to heaven, after the 40 days with his disciples, Jesus took with him those who came from the grave with him on that Sunday morning. When Jesus came from the grave, people came from the grave with him. At his ascension after the 40 days with his disciples, he takes them to heaven. Listen to what the Bible says. The tomb broke open and the bodies of many holy people, righteous people, those who died in the Lord, who had died, raised to life. That's on Sunday morning at the resurrection of Jesus. He must bring with him some trophies. They came out of the tomb. And after Jesus' resurrection, they went into the holy city, New Jerusalem, and appeared to many. In other words, you have any doubt that Jesus was resurrected? You saw me when I died. You buried me. I'm your cousin. I'm your mother. I'm your father. You buried me. And now I'm alive. Why am I alive? Because Jesus brought me from the grave with him. Jesus was just dressed rehearsing for when he comes the second time. When he blows the trumpet and the dead in Christ shall rise first. He has power over grave and, and death. And so after 40 days in the, in the, in, in, in the city of Jerusalem. Jesus is about to ascend back to heaven and he takes with him those who came from the grave. Listen to the story of redemption. Listen to the story of redemption there. Acts of the Apostles chapter 4. Read this. Christ's ascension to heaven was the signal that his followers were to receive the promised blessing. What is the promised blessing? The outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Jesus says, it's expedient for you that I go. If I do not go, the comforter will not come. Well, no, he has gone. So this is a signal that the promise that he has made is going to be fulfilled. When Christ passed within the heavenly gates, when Christ passed within the heavenly gates, he was enthroned amidst the adoration of angels. Remember, Gabriel is the one in charge of the angelic host now after Lucifer was kicked out. Well, he kicked out himself out of disobedience. The father says to Gabriel, listen, my son is ready to come back home. And Gabriel says, father, we've been waiting for this for a long time. We've been waiting for the prince. We've been waiting for the king of kings. We've been waiting for our savior and our redeemer. We've been waiting for our creator to come back. The father says to Gabriel, it's time. Jesus is coming home today. Gabriel calls all the angels together and he puts a plan in place. He says, listen, I'm going to divide us up into two groups. Some of you are going to come down to earth with me to get the master. And some of you are going to stay in heaven and wait for you are going to be the welcoming host. And Gabriel says to them, those of you who are staying behind, this is the plan. We are going to leave earth. And we are going to be making a whole bunch of noise on our way back up. And when we get to the gates of heaven, what I want you to do is shut the door. The angel says, what? What do you mean shut the door? He says, yes, we want you to shut the door. When you see Jesus approaching, shut the gates. And when Jesus, along with the angels who went down to earth to get him, along with those who were resurrected with him on Sunday morning, as they approached the heavenly courts, the angels on the inside shut the door and Gabriel shouted with a loud voice, Psalm 24, open the gates and let the king of glory come in. And those on the inside echoed, who is this king of glory that you're talking about? As though they did not know. And those on the outside shouted, he's the Lord God, mighty savior of mankind. So open the gates and let the king of glory come in. Those on the inside shouted again, who is this king of glory? They are asking the question because they want to hear the name of Jesus over and over again. And this thing goes on and goes on. Celebration over the king of glory who has returned a conqueror over the enemy, a defeater 
of Satan, a conqueror of death and the grave, a redeemer of mankind. He has returned to heaven as king of kings and lord of lords. Open the gates, Gabriel says, and let the king of glory come in. Listen to how the thing continues. Listen to this. As soon as the ceremony was finished, as soon as the ceremony was complete, the ceremony started on, on, on when Jesus ascended. As soon as the ceremony was completed, the Holy Spirit descended upon the disciples in a rich current. The Pentecostal outpouring, when did the Holy Spirit descend? The Holy Spirit descended on the day of Pentecost. The Pentecostal outpouring was heaven's communication that the Redeemer's inauguration was accomplished. The inauguration in heaven lasted for 10 days. 10 days of sweet fellowship and melody in heaven rejoicing. And angels giving a toast to Jesus and thing. Sweet fellowship in heaven there. Over the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah who has returned home. And so on that day of Pentecost, when the Holy Spirit descended upon the, upon the 120 disciples there, and Peter began to preach on the day of Pentecost, the Bible says, thousands were called into fellowship with God. Thousands accepted Jesus as Savior. This was the fulfillment of the first fruit that Pentecost points to. And just as how Jesus fulfilled Passover on the 14th of Abib, and he fulfilled the Feast of Unleavened Bread on the 15th, he fulfilled the wave sheaf on the 16th of Abib on the 5th of Zin. He also fulfilled Pentecost when he sent the Holy Spirit upon the disciples and the first fruit of the Christian church was brought in. Thousands came into fellowship with Jesus. Thousands came into the fellowship of the Holy Spirit that day. And so Passover was fulfilled. Unleavened bread was fulfilled. Wave shift was fulfilled. Pentecost was fulfilled. The last three feasts relate to the second coming of Christ. Remember. The first four feasts, the first four, Passover, Unleavened Bread, Wave Shift, and Pentecost, the first four relate to the first advent of Jesus and the early church. The last three feasts, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Feast of Tabernacles relate to the second coming of Jesus and the end time church. The first four relate to the first advent of Jesus and the early church. The last three relate to the second advent of Jesus and the last day church. Listen to this statement here. In like manner, great controversy chapter 22, praise God. In like manner, the types, that's the feast, which relate to the second advent must be fulfilled at the time appointed or the time pointed out in the symbolic service. What's the symbolic service? The Old Testament ceremonies. Listen to this. The fifth feast. The fifth feast. Remember, the first four feasts took place in the beginning of the ceremonial year. But the last three feasts are taking place at the beginning of the civil year. It is almost as though God is shifting. He's transitioning from one phase to another. And so the last three feasts, Feast of Trumpets, Day of Atonement, and Feast of Tabernacles, relate to the shift into the end time. The closing up 
of the great controversy. The fifth feast, which is the feast of trumpets, look at this. The fifth feast, the feast of trumpets, took place on the first day of the civil year, which is the first day of the month of Tishri. The first day of the civil year, which is the first day of the month of Tishri, was the Feast of Trumpets. What happened on that day? The priest blew a trumpet throughout the nation, warning them that in the next 10 days, judgment was coming. When and how was that fulfilled? The prophetic timeline tells us that that was fulfilled around 1833 with people like William Miller and his associates, not just in North America, but the, the history tells us of the great awakening that is about to take place upon the world, that in South America, in Europe, all over the world, from about the 1800s to 1833, People are preaching the same thing without a knowledge of each other that judgment is coming. Something is about to happen upon the world. Get your house in order because Jesus is coming soon. When William Miller preached this, he thought that Jesus was coming in 1844. But he was preaching that something is about to happen. Judgment is coming. In a prophetic understanding, we see the trumpets being fulfilled with the preaching of the gospel in 1833 and thereabout. Well, 10 days after the Feast of Trumpets was the Day of Atonement. We are talking prophetically here, and therefore we got to think about 10 years, not 10 days. What happened 10 years after 1833? 1844. Day of atonement began in heaven. The feast of trumpets that William Miller and the others were blowing and sounding was to say to the world, get ready because judgment is about to begin. On to 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed and that sanctuary began to be cleansed in heaven. Jesus entered upon his final work as high priest of those who have accepted salvation through him. And in 1844, the day of atonement in the prophetic timeline began. Ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, brothers and sisters, there is only one feast waiting to be fulfilled. That's the last and longest feast. That's the Feast of Tabernacles. The Feast of Tabernacles is the last of the feast. And it is the longest of the feast. That feast is 1,000 years long. The Bible says, the Bible says, oh, hallelujah, this is beautiful. Give me strength, O Holy Spirit. In the Old Testament, the Feast of Tabernacles, the children of Israel had to leave their permanent homes. And they had to go dwell in a temporary shelter. Get this. In the Old Testament, the children of Israel had to leave their permanent homes during the Feast of Tabernacles. And they had to go live in a, in a temporary shelter. The same thing is going to happen to God's people. We are going to leave our permanent home, which is the earth. The earth is our home. We are going to leave our permanent home and we are going to stay in a temporary shelter for 1,000 years. Because when this 1,000 years is finished, God is going to clean up the earth so we can inhabit the earth. The children of Israel, we are going to enjoy sweet fellowship with each other for 1,000 years during the Feast of Tabernacles. God's people are rejoicing in heaven, just as the children of Israel rejoiced over two particular things in the Old Testament. The bountiful harvest over the year that had just gone, and the fact that they were alive after the Day of Atonement. So too, God's people in heaven are rejoicing over two particular things. We are rejoicing that God, through Jesus, 
has brought in a bountiful harvest of souls. From the first man who died, Abel, to the last redeemed of the earth, the 144,000, will be gathered together on that sea that looks like glass, and we are going to be rejoicing over the multitudes who have accepted salvation and are rejoicing in the presence of their Savior. But we are also going to be rejoicing that the day of atonement has passed. And we were kept alive, not because of anything good in us, but because of the blood of the Lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world, who covered us in his righteousness and who claimed us as his own. And when we stand on that sea that looks like glass and Jesus stands before us, we're going to take our crowns from off our heads and we're going to place them at the feet of Jesus because we are going to understand that we are not worthy to be there. The only person who is worthy is Jesus. And we are going to worship the lamb who is the lion of the tribe of Judah who has brought redemption and salvation to us. My brothers and sisters, there is only one feast waiting to happen. And so my question to you today, will you be there? Will you be there, boys and girls? Will you be there, my brothers and sisters? Will you be there, ladies and gentlemen? There might be someone listening to me today. You have not yet surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. I want to appeal to your heart today that as you hear the voice of God, harden not your heart. Accept Jesus as Savior and Lord. Time is about to come to an end. If the six other feasts were fulfilled as God designed them to be fulfilled on the guarantee of God's word, Feast of Tabernacles will soon happen. I want to pray that God would keep us faithful to himself. That when he returns, and that return is soon, that we would be gathered with him and rejoice in his presence for our salvation that is full and free. Pray God's blessings upon you tonight. May he cause his face to shine upon you. May the salvation that he offers be yours. And when he comes, may he find us faithful. God's richest blessings upon you. As we prepare for tomorrow night, I want to share with you the reading assignment. I pray that you are reading the reading assignments. Early writings, the end of the 2300 days. Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 1. Prophets and Kings, chapter 58. God's mighty blessings be upon you tonight. And may God keep you faithful to himself. Until we meet again, God's richest blessings upon you.